तमो तस्सा भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धस The subject of the discourse today, uh, it's actually the continuation of a series on who is the maker of one's destiny. That is action and destiny. That is the series. Uh, we have already discussed a few, uh, I think three, case histories on that to show that the maker of one's destiny is not outside oneself, but in oneself. It's not a supernormal power or some divine agency or a creator god or whatever you may call it, but it is one's action that creates one's destiny. Now this is the series on which we have been discussing. Well, I will read out, I will recapitulate some of the case histories today uh, so that we can take up the latest one. The latest case history is that of Anatha Pindika, where the Buddha said at the end that Idha Nandati, Idha Pecha Nandati, Kata Punyo Ubhayatha Nandati, Punyang Mekatanti Nandati, Bhiyo nandati sukkati ngato. The doer of good delights here and hereafter. He delights in both the worlds. The thought, good have I done indeed, delights him. And he delights even more when gone to realms of bliss. So here, we see two things. One is, he delights, the doer of good delights here, and the other hereafter. So he delights while actually acting his own conduct, his own actions, delights him when he is actually performing his action. So he delights when a thing is cause, it is uh, the cause and the effect. While doing something, causing something, he delights, or delighting he causes, and the, when he uh, experiences the effect of the cause, that is hereafter, then too he delights. So there are two points, cause and effect. Action as a cause and the result of the action, you see, in at both points, while causing one delights and when one experiences the, uh, the result of the cause, the action, then also one delights. So, and there the thought, the good have I done, delights him. Every time he has the thought coming to him, every time he delights. And as a result of the action, which a delightful action, when he experiences the result in the realms of bliss hereafter, there also he delights immensely. Now this is the Dhammapada Gatha number 18. Based on that today we are going to have our discussion. See, the, the case history is that of Anatha Pindika. He was the chief uh, uh, devotee, the Dayaka, the, sub, who, uh, the benefactor of the Jetavana monastery. He built the monastery as well as he supported. There were 12,500 monks living in the Jetavana monastery. And he was supporting. It is said that 2,000 monks every day were, uh, you see, offered the alms meals in his house with great respect and reverence. They were invited in 
and they were offered. And uh, and he not only did this every day of the year, but you see he became, uh, you see, a great demand for others also who wanted to, who followed the same thing. The last number of great settees in the city of the, Sabathi those days. Sabathi was one of the biggest cities of India. And it was the uh, business capital of India, so to say, in those, do, those days, just as Bombay is today. Bombay is the business capital of India. So, Sabathi happened to be one of such uh, cities. So a large number of very wealthy people, they had become the disciples of the Buddha. And they uh, delighted in offering alms food uh, to the monks. And so they wanted the guidance of, you see, Anatha Pindika. So they would invariably, whenever they had a big function where they invited large number of monks and uh, hear the Dhamma from them, uh, but mostly, you see, when uh, the, the Sangha, the holy order of monks headed by the Buddha himself. So on such occasions, you see, they will invite Anatha Pindika uh, to give them the guidance and uh, all that. So Anatha Pindika not only uh, offered himself, but he helped others also to do, to do the same thing. So it so happened that often he would be out. So in his own house, uh, he was not there while the monks uh, came, as usual, 2,000 of them. So he, um, he told his own daughter, he had three daughters, one was uh, Maha Subhadda, the second was Chula Subhadda, third was Sumana Devi. Today's story is based on uh, Sumana Devi. So here, uh, you see, uh, he asked his eldest daughter, who was very spiritually inclined and uh, very devout indeed, and she has uh, already progressed on the spiritual path greatly. She had become a Sotapana herself. But then she was also a uh, married person. So after a time she had to go to her, uh, uh, you see, in-law's place. So that is how uh, the responsibilities fell on the second. Second too was as good as the first. She too was very highly de developed. In fact, all the three girls. So the second one too after a time had to go. Then the third one, the youngest girl, took over. And Sumana Devi. And she was single. She said, no, I don't want to get married. She refused. She was a very, uh, you see, earnest meditator. She practiced meditation very intensively. And a very devout person indeed, Upaseka. And she delighted in offering dana to the monks every day, to 2,000 of them. And uh, uh, that is how uh, the household of Anatha Pindaka was, you see, all the time, uh, you see, it was, it's like a dana sala, a great festivity every day, almost. So, this uh, young lady kept up all that and she had progressed very much. She had progressed even more than her sisters or her father. She was not only Sota Panna, but she became a Sakara Gami, the second stage of enlightenment. And a very earnest meditator, very serious person indeed. Now she fell ill. Suddenly something happened and she fell very seriously ill. And um, uh, so she had to be, uh, you see, looked after by the uh, doctors. So she was, she actually knew that she, her end is coming. And she told everybody, she said, look here, now my end is coming. Now I would like to talk to my father. 
I will talk to my uh, you see, to her father before I go. So the household, they were all very much uh, disturbed, but somebody, of course, looked after the managers and others, looked after the day-to-day -day, uh, dana service. And so this, uh, uh, he, Anatha Pindika had gone to some other's house to uh, give them guidance about, uh, because Buddha himself was uh, coming to that place. So when uh, this person, the messenger, went there in their house and told Anatha Pindika that your daughter is very, very ill and she, she is very anxious to see you. So he had to excuse himself and go uh, return home in great hurry. Then uh, Anatha Pindika went straight to her and said, Beloved daughter, how are you? How are you feeling? He says, well, younger brother, I am okay. I am all right. Now, when he was addressed as younger brother, the father thought, ah, this is delirium. This is incoherent now, something very unfortunate. So she says, my dear daughter, you are talking inco incoherently. You are not coherent in what you are talking about. He says, no, no, my younger brother, I am very coherent. I am perfectly all right. There is no problem with me. Then he says, my dear daughter, are you afraid? At this point, he says, younger brother, fear doesn't trouble me. I am not afraid. Having said that, she just passed away. Smiling, she passed away. That was the last breath. Now this disturbed the great Sati profoundly. You know, he was one of the richest and, uh, you see, billionaire of the time. He had uh, overseas, um, he had, he owned ships that went to the foreign countries. And he had a business empire, huge, huge, and an industrial empire for that matter. Caravans and these, that, all kinds of things. So, but he was totally devoted to spiritual life. He was a Sotapanna himself. Then, when he saw, when this happened, he was so utterly disturbed. But uh, he had to come attend to the, uh, the, you see, the funeral services. So he immediately, uh, uh, you see, attended to all that. All the people came and the whole household was in commotion. Something terrible happened. And uh, so they had to arrange for the cremation of the, child, of the uh, young lady. And uh, when everything was done and uh, finished, say it was uh, around 4, 4, 35 o'clock, see he went and had a dip in the river after uh, cremating her and all that, finishing all the, uh, the things that, uh, that needed to be done at that time. So uh, he came to Buddha. He literally broke down. He started crying. An elderly person crying before the Lord, and he had never done that before. So the Buddha said, Oh great devotee, what's the matter with you? Why are you crying? What makes you weeping? What happened? Buddha knew the whole thing, yet he had to do this. So he asked like this. Then now, Anatha Pindika, he, though he broke down completely and when the Buddha said what's happened and all that, he said, this is what happened. My youngest daughter who is look, looking after the, uh, the task of feeding all the monks and uh, she suddenly fell ill and was very quick. He suddenly fell ill and then he's, he's no more. Lord, he is no more, and he started crying again. Then 
Buddha said, well, great sati, death is inevitable. That is the only certain thing that can happen to anybody. The most uncertain thing is living itself. You know that. He said, yes, Lord, I do know, but I am greatly worried for, not because she has passed away only, but because the way she passed away. Then the Buddha said, well, what happened? He said, she passed away in a state of delirium. She was completely out of wit. So then he described the entire thing, what happened. He said, you see, I was in, his, in the so-and-so's house, and Lord knows all that very well. Then I came away. And uh, there I said, my dear daughter, how are you? Are you all right? What's the matter with you? This, she said, younger brother, I am very well. There is no problem with me. I'm okay, and she smiled. <coughs> then they said, he said, well, she called me younger brother. So I thought, I'm the father and I'm, she is calling me younger brother. I mean, conventionally. She said, she must be in a state of delirium. So I thought, Lord. And then I told her, look, my dear child, you see, you are talking incoherently, not properly. He says, younger brother, I am not talking incoherently. I am perfectly all right. I mean, in the control of my senses, I am all right. I am not incoherent. Then he said, dear daughter, are you afraid? She says, no, brother, younger brother, I am not afraid. And she smiled and just passed away. Then, Lord, that absolutely shocked me. I have never gone, undergone a state of this kind, experience of this kind. So what is the, yeah, I mean, uh, how to explain this, Lord, I don't know, so I am very much disturbed, indeed. So the Buddha said, calm down, Upasaka, Maha Upasaka, please calm down. Lord, please tell me, where is she now? Buddha said, no, he was, she was not talking to you incoherently. She was in perfectly in a state of wisdom. Do you know why he called you younger brother? He says, Lord, why? He says, you are a sotapanna. And she has gone beyond that. She has reached the second stage of enlightenment. He sees a sakadagami. Since you are spiritually younger to him, uh, to her, that is why at the last moment she wanted to remind you that, look here, I have gone beyond and you must try further. Don't remain where you are. Put forth effort and go forward. That is, what, that is the message she wanted to carry to you. So you, of course, took it in the conventional way. You didn't look at things from the ultimate standpoint. There are two states, uh, two uh, ways of expressing truth. One is the conventional reality, and the other is the ultimate reality. Now, she was talking from the standpoint of ultimate reality, where she referred to you as a younger brother, as a person who is spiritually younger to her. You have reached the first stage of spiritual, uh, you see. A transformation, while she has reached the second stage, which is much higher. That's why she called you younger brother. That's the fact. So you thought she was talking incoherently from the 
conventional selves, but no, she was not. Then Lord, she was not in a state of delirium. No, she was not. She was perfectly in, a, in, in her senses. Then the Lord, where is she now? Where is she reborn? Because she has got one more, uh, you see, Sagara Gami. She can be reborn at just one more time in the Kama Loka. So where is she reborn? Buddha said, in the Tusita Deva Loka, the highest of the Deva Lokas in the Kama, uh, Kama Vachara, and beyond that is the Mara Loka, two more. So, uh, when he heard this, he was completely, you see, he calmed, he came, he became very, very, very calm and exceedingly, uh, you know, spiritually sort of inspired. So this is the story behind. And then the Buddha repeated this Gata. He said, <clears throat> immediately after that, having revealed where she was born, Buddha said, the doer of good delights here and hereafter. He or she delights in both the worlds. The thought, good have I done, delights him or her. And he or she delights even more when gone to realm of bliss, that is the Tushita realm. Now, so here, uh, you see, I, uh, the two things. One is, while an action is performed, uh, and that becomes the cause. And every action, you see, when it, uh, when it is matured, when it gets matured, and then gives the result, or gives the fruit of the action, that is the... Uh, the the consequence of the action. So there are two points, cause and effect. While actually doing the action, she, she delighted all the time. She was looking after the uh, very important task of the family, namely looking after the, the, all the monks. Every day she, she was in charge of uh, you see, serving the monks. Two thousand monks came every day for Dhanasar for uh, Pindapata, for the alms food. And she saw to it that they were served properly, that the food was properly prepared, which, etc., and all the details. And every day she did that. And she did it with great joy indeed. She delighted all the time. And uh, she exulted at all that she was doing. She was very, very happy. And then at the end, suddenly, when her, uh, you see, time came, she, as I have already mentioned, she was single. She didn't like to get married, and she was highly spiritually evolved already. So she understood that her time has come. When she fell ill, she understood this is my end. For this life, it is over. So she went through the usual, uh, you know, the routine of doctor coming and giving medicine and this, that and so on. But then at the end, when the time actually of her departure came, she told the family that, you see, I would like to see my father. So he had to be called. He had gone out on a social visit to help the other family, uh, which he did very, very often. And so when he returned very quickly, he said after hearing that she was uh, in a very serious state. So when he returned, he told her, well, my dear daughter, you see, uh, to repeat the same thing once again, are you all right, etc.? And she said, yes, I am perfectly all right, younger brother. Now when she said younger brother, 
Obviously, she was talking from the standpoint of paramattha satcha. See, here two things should be understood. That a communication is possible in two ways. You can communicate reality, you see, or uh, if you are talking about truth, you can communicate truth in two ways. One in a, in a you see, in a conventional way, where you use the comma, you see, the conceptual, uh, the conventional terms, etc., and uh, which is, of course, just a, a makeshift, uh, you see, arrangement which human beings do for to enable them to live uh, to live a kind of organized life. So there, the question of father, mother, brother, sister, all these sort of things come my property, my daughter, my this, my that. All those things are conventional usages. Whereas in, from the ultimate standpoint, a human being can be reduced to five aggregates of phenomena, both material and mental. Ultimately, a person can be reduced to mind and you see, nama and aggregates of mental aggregates and rupa, that is the physical or material aggregate, the body. Mind and body ultimately, the whole thing gets reduced to that. Now, if you are going to call everybody mind and body, you can't live an organized life at all. So, in order to, uh, you see, uh, to to be able to identify each each individual and uh, you see according to the task assigned to a particular individual and so on you have to use uh, some you have to give name and uh, the whole conventional way of living social life family life all that develops on that so now at the last moment of our existence she was already a spiritually highly evolved person. So she used the uh, paramattha mode and she wanted to send a message to the father because at the last moment she said, I want to talk to him. And uh, this talking to him with a purpose. So she wanted to carry by, you see, give him this message that, look, you have attained spiritual transformation at the very first stage and you have to put forth effort further to go to the various stages, other stages. The, the enlightenment process as such, it is a process. It is, there is no such thing as sudden enlightenment where you suddenly become a saint and an enlightened person, a liberated person from the bondages of samsaric existence. No. It's, uh, there are four distinct stages of enlightenment. They are known as the four lokutra, uh, you see, jnana. That is the four super mundane or trans mundane stages of insight, experience of ultimate reality. It's an insightful experience where you see, you experience reality as it is, without <coughs> using conventional terms, without using concepts. These are all mental constructs. So any of that, you directly experience truth. And uh, in terms of, uh, you see, the, the, the phenomena, you can so the, a man can be ultimately reduced to these five aggregates, as I mentioned. Panchakhanda, the five aggregates. The aggregate of uh, the body represent, representing the aggregate of matter or materiality. And the mind which represents four aggregates. The aggregate of feelings, aggregate of perception, or memory, 
aggregate of mental formations and aggregate of consciousness, the mind. That not, here consciousness means to be conscious means to know. So when we talk of knowledge, we are talking of this, uh, the aggregate. It's a whole complex. Knowledge is knowing something, to be conscious of something. So that's an aggregate by itself. It's a, an aggregate by its very, uh, by the term itself, you see, it means a complex phenomena. It's not just one thing. Many things put together, a concatenation of conditions, they form an aggregate. So all these aggregates put together make what we call a man or a woman or uh, some other name that you can say Indian or a Chinese or a, an American or a Negro or whatever. So these names are put in order to make, in order to identify phenomena, things, that's all. So here the young person, the, uh, the Sumana Devi, she was looking, you see, using it purely from the standpoint of ultimate truth and she wanted to send a message to the father. She wanted to send a message as a kind, as an act of great gratitude. She loved obviously her father and she said, Father, you must wake up now, put forth effort, go forward. I am going. We all have to go one day. Nobody is permanent in this world. Samsara or worldly existence is characterized by certain laws. Number one, the law of impermanence. Everything is changing constantly. Nothing is permanent. So in this impermanent context of existence, everything is uncertain. Whatever is impermanent, you can't be certain of it. It is, you see, uh, you know, it's basically unpredictable. Whatever is changeful, whatever is uh, impermanent and uncertain cannot be stable. And that which is not stable cannot be perfect, cannot be dependent upon. So ultimately life, if you look at life from the standpoint of ultimate truth, that is anicca, anityam, impermanent. You will see from the standpoint of the ultimate truth, when you look at life as impermanent, you really can't hold on to it. You can, you will have to give up your attachment for uh, life. It all, it just, it, it falls away, so to say. A person who, has, who is spiritually transformed, who has become a sota panna. You see, his world is very different, his perceptions of everything very different indeed. So she was uh, talking from the ultimate standpoint, while he used the, the normal uh, conventional usage. My daughter, how are you, my daughter? Are you all right, etc. So these are conventional ways of communication. So while he, he remained at the conventional level, she was in the ultimate level. So that is why there was this, uh, the message did not actually reach. So there are two different levels of communication. That is why he temporarily became emotional. But as soon as Lord Buddha reminded him, look here, this is the reality. Reality of impermanence. Death is just, it's nothing but a dramatization of the law of impermanence. In a very dramatic manner, you see, here you are, my most dear ones, 
my father, my mother, my sister, my daughter, brother, my daughter, my son. We were just now here, now no more. That sudden awakening to a state of, you see, uh, this impermanence, the law of impermanence, it creates two different reactions altogether. One is the reaction where you become emotional. Oh, loss. So you grieve, you lament, you cry. Loss, a sense of loss. You are filled with sorrow. The other is a profound sense of insightful understanding of truth, of life. There you become sober, calm. So now, you see, the message was not correct. There are two levels. So when he became, uh, and the impact was very, very sudden. He had come from somebody else's house. And here, here he was confronted with this. I uh, think the daughter was dying. He never thought that the daughter is going to die. He had appointed doctors, these, that, the whole paraphernalia, they were all there. So suddenly this, you see, uh, so in his stage of enlightenment, obviously, uh, you see, that was just the initial stage. Therefore, this kind of slip could occur, and it occurred. So when the Buddha reminded him, look here, death is the only certain thing. Everything passes away. So do not become emotional. Calm down and try to understand things according to ultimate reality. He accepted forthwith. No question about it. And he accepted and he says, uh, yes, Lord, I have understood. So he changed his uh, everything thereafter. Now, the important, there are a number of important points which we need to understand here. Number one is, what exactly is enlightenment? Now, that is the goal of life. For all spiritual seekers, all seekers of perfection, all seekers who want to uh, attain the state, the deathless state, Amarabhava, deathless, the state of immortality, the state of ultimate bliss and happiness. Because in, a, in, a, in the context of impermanence, whatever happiness you achieve also is impermanent, is bound to change. It cannot be a lasting happiness at all, and it is not. Life itself is changing. You are young, very good, you behave like a young fellow, all kinds of foolish ways, and then you become a further a youth, you see. Then you are filled with all kinds of the youthful uh, delusions and a sense of beauty and permanence and these, that power and all that sort of thing. You are drugged, so to say. You are intoxicated with your youth. Now, then comes the middle age and the responsibility of the family. By then you have already got uh, involved, you are a married person, you have got children, you have got to earn, and you have got all social obligations and family responsibilities. There you completely get lost in all that. And the question of searching for ultimate truth and all that, no, it does not come. Then you get completely intoxicated with what you like, the pleasures of life. All the uh, sensual pleasures we enjoy all your life, and you get totally caught in that. Then as you grow old, and you see the body is subject to all kinds of diseases, and then it becomes frail and delicate, and you can't eat all that you wanted to, you enjoyed all your life. Your capacity to eat, everything is gone now. You can't see things your eye doesn't see. You can't hear things properly. 
all these, one by one, all your faculties fail. So when you come to that stage and you become aware, ah, yes, life indeed is impermanent. But then it is too late. The mind has been already conditioned in a, to think in a certain manner, to behave in a certain manner, to perceive objects in a certain manner. So though you become aware of the impermanence of things, it is too late because you have not cultivated your life during the, uh, during the period that you have, you see. So that is why the Buddha always said, look here, the mind gets easily conditioned. It gets habituated because of being familiarized to all kinds of concepts and ways of thinking and perceiving and so on. So take up your spiritual, uh, you say, the task of uh, getting spiritually perfected. And what is this task of getting spiritually perfected? If you are subject to greed, cut down greed. And that you can do by accepting certain uh, a principal way of living a lifestyle. Now, if you are fond of taking a lot of meat and this and that, therefore you go and uh, indulge in hunting, you say, it's my birthright to kill. God has created animal for me to eat. But if the same logic as, uh, is applied by the animal, saying, oh, God has created man for me to eat, you don't accept that logic. But you impose that logic when it comes to your enjoying the thing. So that is one way of this is how the world gets used to all this sort of thing. And they can't get out of it. But there are people who say, no, let me not live, you see, a violent life. So well, food need not be, you see, you need not kill to eat something. Now, you have developed a society a kind of civilization where everything is available a plenty. You go to a market, you can buy anything you like, if you have the money. So, if you are a vegetarian, non-vegetarian, you will love it. Very good. Go and buy something which is already a dead matter, and there it doesn't uh, involve you in killing. But you can, at the same time, uh, you see, satisfy your tongue. And if you are spiritually evolved, you don't care about any food anyway. Because food is only to support the body. And uh, uh, keep the body in a, stay, in a fit condition so that you can uh, deal with the mind. And you can perfect your mind. Develop your mind. All the, uh, the uh, you see, inner possibilities of the mind. Mind is a very great mind. M-I-N-E a repository of great power, great knowledge, great wisdom. So cultivate the mind. So a wise person, therefore, will not be, uh, you see, caught by um, these habits. For, for, to begin with the habit formation, he will one by one give up. So no killing, but you see, uh, promote the well-being of all life, practice metta. So as you uh, change your lifestyle, change your uh, mode of thinking and everything, life itself becomes very different. And by the time you become an old man, you get used to this panchashila discipline. You don't kill, you don't steal, you don't commit sexual misconduct. You don't tell lies, you don't drink um, alcoholic uh, beverages and so on. So you, uh, you see, shape your life, you manage your life in such a way that while you are, you enjoy whatever you, uh, whatever there is, but you don't hurt anybody. If you give up killing, well, you are giving away dana. You are giving a gift of fearlessness to 
hundreds and thousands of uh, innocent creatures. So this life of moral and, you see, ethical perfection, spiritual life starts with moral and ethical purity. So once you develop with this Panchashila, your Sila and Sila Vishuddhi, purity of moral conduct, virtuous conduct, once you do that, mind also undergoes a change. And the mind undergoing a change, then everything, everything becomes very, very different in life. With a pure moral conduct you meditate. Now if you practice, for instance, uh, for uh, this non-killing amounts to metta, universal love. Now there is a way of cultivating universal love by way of practicing meditation. So as you take up these disciplines at the, at the, you see, moral or ethical level, then at the mental level, you purify the mind totally by, through your meditation and so on, and allow insights into reality to grow, wisdom to grow. So wisdom is not merely just knowledge, it's much more than that. So this way as you, you see, live, you manage your life in a new way, your life becomes very different. And at the end, though the body becomes very weak and delicate and very frail, the mind becomes strong, powerful. So this story of Anatha Pindika, uh, it deals with Gati, that means our destiny. And we will continue with this series uh, next week. And we'll take up all the uh, historical, the, the, the case histories and uh, go into the, you see, what exactly is the process of enlightenment, all the four stages. Then what is the process of living as an unenlightened being? How this unenlightened existence can be turned into an enlightened existence? So all these very practically practical and important points in life, all these we'll have to uh, you know go through. We have to examine and investigate and see, so that improve the quality of life. So with this, I conclude. May the grace of Lord Buddha surround your lives with wisdom and well-being. May you all be happy and well. Sukino bhavantu.